Hi students, we are back in the gas chapter and we've talked a lot about the characteristics of gases and what they do and in other chapters we've talked about solids and liquids but the question is why is some substance a solid whereas other substances are liquids and others are gases? Well, this has to do with intra and intermolecular forces. Now, intra molecular forces are forces that hold atoms or ions together within the same compound. And we've talked about these before. We've talked about ionic bonding, polar covalent bonding, and nonpolar covalent bonding. We haven't talked about metallic bonding. But that happens when you have a metal and those atoms are next to each other, like say we have silver or you could do gold or any of your other metals. Oops, AG. And what happens is they all have electrons and the electrons kind of swim around all of the atoms and they kind of share this electron soup. In other chemistry classes, you guys will hear more about that, but we're not gonna talk too much about that, if at all. So um, those are within a compound. Now, intermolecular forces, um, these are forces that exist between compounds. So what you see down here is that the intramolecular attraction right here, that is a covalent bond and that's a polar covalent bond. So that would be this right here. And we see that it's polar because the chlorine is pulling the electrons away from the hydrogen because the chlorine has a higher electronegativity. And then over on the other side, you can see that we have intermolecular attraction. So that's the attraction between this molecule of HCl and this molecule of HCl. Now, you don't have to have two of the same kinds of molecules like an HCl. HCl and an HCl. You can have an HCl and an HBr, and that would be intermolecular, so between different molecules. And these intermolecular forces are dipole-dipole interactions, hydrogen bonding, and London dispersion forces, also called London forces or just dispersion forces. And we're going to talk a whole lot about these guys in this lecture and also ionic bonding. So ionic bonding and then these three guys down here. And that's going to give us a really good picture of uh, why something is behaving as a solid, a liquid, or a gas at room temperature. And remember in science, room temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, even if it's hotter or colder than the room that you are currently sitting in. So room temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, so this is a little bit of a review about um, solids, liquids, and gases. So you've seen this exact same slide before. Um, so just to remind you guys, um, gases have an indefinite shape and an indefinite volume, meaning that whatever you put it into, the gas will expand or contract to fit the volume of that container, and it'll take the shape of that container. So they can expand and we can compress them. They're also fluids, so they flow just like um, the natural gas that flows through the gas line in your house for your water heater or your dryer or your stove if you have a gas water heater, gas dryer, or gas stove. Um, and they have low density. And what this means is that there is a lot of just space between these molecules. So there isn't a whole lot of mass for the volume that you have there. So remember our density is mass over volume. So if you have a large volume and you have a small mass, 
that means that your density is going to be small. So if you had a, a mass of one milligram and you had a volume of 36,000 liters, I just made that stuff up, your density is going to end up being a small number. Now, gases, they tend to be small molecules and they tend to be nonpolar. Obviously, this is just in general. Now, small molecules, because they're so small and light, they can zip around and they can behave like a, a gas molecule. Um, and if they're nonpolar, then that means that they're not attracted to each other very much, which means when they meet each other, they bounce off and they go their merry way, creating a lot of space between these molecules. So that's what we tend to see for gases. Now, if you think about this, in liquids and solids, the molecules or the atoms are close to each other. So for gases to be far apart, they have to be not attracted to each other. Because if they're attracted to each other, they're going to want to stay close to each other. Now liquids, what we have is we have molecules that are pretty close together, but they're far enough apart where they can slip past each other. These are also fluids. They do have a definite volume. So two liters of water is two liters of water, whether it's in a beaker or whether it's in a jug, but they do not have a definite shape. So they also take the shape of their container. And unlike gases, liquids have high densities, which means that there is a lot of stuff in that space. So there's not a lot of volume between the molecules. So large mass um, per unit volume. And you can't compress liquids very much because the molecules are already really close to each other. And they also have low expansion, not very much expansion when you heat them up because these molecules tend to be attracted to each other. So they don't want to come apart. They don't want to expand very much. So what we tend to see with liquids is we tend to see molecules that are attracted to each other. And that means that a lot of times you've got polar molecules like water. So with water, what we have is we have a partial negative side and we have partial positive sides. And this water will be attracted to this water because the partial negative on oxygen of one water molecule is attracted to the partial positive side of other water molecules. And you can fill in with a bunch of water molecules. And so that's keeping them close together. Now solids, solids we've got um, atoms or ions that are really, really close together. There's not any space between them and they tend to be stuck where they're at. And this means that we have a definite shape and a definite volume. So if you have a block of aluminum and you move it into a different container, that block of aluminum is going to occupy the same volume and it's going to keep its shape. It's not going to take the shape of whatever container you put it into. Solids also have a high density because they've got a lot of stuff in a little bit of space. And they have very little thermal expansion because these particles are very attracted to each other. So they don't want to come apart. It's hard to get them apart. Now, very little thermal expansion doesn't mean no thermal expansion. If you think about the concrete on the overpasses of the um, freeways that we have, what you might notice is that there's a little bit of space in between. 
when you look up at the overpasses. And what you have to have that little bit of space for is thermal expansion. So in the summer when it gets super hot, the concrete is going to expand a little bit. And if you didn't have that little bit of space in order to accommodate that, the overpasses uh, would buckle. So they'd go up or down and that wouldn't be very good for driving over. Alrighty, so let's talk about the different types of attractions that we have going on that are causing things to be solid liquid or gas at room temperature. Now, ionic bonds. Ionic bonds, these occur between ions and we've seen this before. So just as a refresher, what happens is you have a couple of atoms and they both want to have an octet and the sodium has one electron in its valence shell, so it wants to get rid of that so that this shell right here will be its valence shell, and it will have eight electrons. And the chlorine says, oh, that's awesome because I have seven valence electrons, and if I just get one more, then I can have an octet also. So over here, we've also got eight valence electrons and both of them are happy and that makes this one positively charged and this one negatively charged and those are whole charges so plus one and minus one so it's not the partial charges like we have with the polar bond these are whole charges and they're very very attracted to each other and they sit next to each other and they're happy and then they attract other ions that love to sit together and all be happy in their attraction. And those attractions are very, very strong. So it takes a large amount of energy to get them apart. Now, when you're super close together like this, that means you're a what? A solid liquid or a gas? You're solid. And if you put a little bit more space between you, that would be a what? A liquid and then if you put a lot of space between those ions you would have what a gas so we can see why having a super strong attraction between two things is causing that to be a solid at room temperature it requires a lot of energy to get those ions apart because they don't want to be apart so with sodium chloride what we have to do to melt it or get these ions to come apart a little bit into the liquid phase is we have to heat it up to 801 degrees Celsius. So that's a lot of heat energy that we would have to put into the system to get those ions to separate. So this compound really, really, really does not want to be in the liquid or gas state. It wants to be in the solid state. And then we have dipole-dipole attractions. So that means that there's polarity in one molecule and there's polarity in another molecule and those poles are gonna be attracted to each other. So if we look at HCl, what we see drawn is that we've got a polar bond there. So we have a partial positive on the hydrogen and we have a partial negative on the chlorine. And how we knew this was because we took a look at electronegativity in a different chapter, and we can see that hydrogen has an electronegativity value of 2.1, and chlorine has an electronegativity value of 3.0. And when we do 3.0 minus 2.1, we get a difference in electronegativity of 0.9. Now, 0.9 qualifies as a polar bond, and we saw that on this slide right here. I believe it, it's in, back in chapter four. And we said above 0.4 and below 2.0, that's where we have polar bonds, or we have unequal sharing of the electrons in that bond. So those two electrons that are in that bond between hydrogen and chlorine, they are shifted over more towards the chlorine because the chlorine is pulling on them more and that gives us the partial negative and the partial positive. So right here, maybe we have our 
1.0-ish, so our 0.9 would be somewhere in here. So it's definitely a polar covalent bond. Now, the negative end of one molecule is attracted to the positive end of another molecule. So this attraction is keeping these molecules closer together than if you had no polarity at all. And if we take a look at chloroform down here at the bottom, what you'll notice it is that chloroform is a liquid. Now chloroform is a pretty small molecule compared to other molecules that we have seen. So we have CHCl3. And if I drew that out in 2D so it was flat, I'd surround the carbon with the chlorines and the hydrogen. Now compare that to CH4, which has the same geometry. And it has a central carbon uh, surrounded by four other atoms. And that right there, CH4, that's methane, that's a gas. And CHCl3, which looks pretty similar, that's a liquid. So that's telling you that those chloroform molecules must be closer together than the methane molecules. And why is this? Well, it's because there's a dipole in chloroform. So the chlorines, again, they are pulling the electrons towards themselves, which creates a partially negative region and a partially positive region on chlorine sorry, chloroform. Now remember you either draw the delta symbols or you draw the dipole moment, but you don't, don't draw them both. So if I were to draw the little blue delta negative and positive symbols on that first chloroform, I wouldn't put the dipole moment, one or the other. So the dipole-dipole attraction between chloroforms makes them attracted enough to stay close enough to where they are in the liquid form. Now, even though HCl has dipole-dipole interaction there, that molecule is still pretty small. And that is still in the gas phase right there. So these are just kind of general trends, so keep that in mind. Now, the next kind of bond that we're going to look at or interaction that we're going to look at is hydrogen bonding. And this is a special kind of dipole-dipole attraction. And it's a very strong dipole-dipole attraction. Not as strong as ionic bonding, but stronger than regular dipole-dipole attraction. And what hydrogen bonds in, um, entail is a hydrogen that is bonded to a very electronegative atom. So right there it says a hydrogen that is bonded to a very electronegative atom, so oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. And we definitely have an oxygen there, and if you need the lone pairs, you can draw them in. On one molecule, and then on another molecule, what you have is a very electronegative atom that has lone pairs that interact with that hydrogen on another molecule. And remember that hydrogen right there has to be bonded to a very electronegative atom. So you've got a lot of strong interaction there. And what this means for this very small molecule right here, which would usually be in the gas category if we were just looking at its size is that it occurs in the liquid phase at room temperature. And that's really good for us because we like to drink water, not just inhale uh, water vapor. 
Um, and what this does is it causes something called surface tension because all of these water molecules are hydrogen bonding to each other. So the hydrogen bond causes that really strong interaction and keeps them close together and keeps them in the liquid phase. But what it also does is these water molecules that are down here, they can interact in all different directions with the different water molecules that surround them. But the ones on the top, they don't have anybody on the top to interact with. So they hold on really strongly to the ones that are next to them. And that means we get something called surface tension. So water looks like it might be something soft to land in if you jump from a large height. But what you'll find is that when you do that, you often feel a huge smack and then your family is like, oh my goodness, you did a huge belly flop there and your stomach hurts and yeah, it's not good. But it means also that water striders can do their water strider business. So if you have never seen a water strider before, what these guys do is they can sit on top of the water without anything to float on, just based on the surface tension of the water. And what happens if there's humans upriver that are washing their dishes with soap in the river is the soap comes on down the river and it messes with the surface tension in our poor little water striders, they drown. And that brings us to London dispersion forces, which again are also called London forces or just dispersion forces. And every molecule will interact with other molecules or other atoms via London dispersion forces. So these are just the forces or the attractions that are always underlying. And if you don't have any other attractions, you always have London dispersion forces. The thing about these is that they are weak. They are very weak. And these are caused by momentary dipoles. Usually we have nonpolar molecules um, that don't have dipoles, but on occasion what happens is that the electrons are naughty. And this electron right here says, hey, party at my house. And these other electrons go wee and they rush on over to this side of the molecule for just a moment in time. And that causes that momentary dipole. So for a moment in time, we have a partial negative and a partial positive in this molecule. Now, if it's sitting next to another molecule, what will happen is the next molecule will say, oh my gosh, like I don't like this. And the electrons that are evenly distributed in the second molecule will rush to the opposite side so that you have a partial negative on the left side and a partial positive on the right side. And then the partial positive will interact with the partial negative and the partial negative will interact with the partial positive. And it has this domino effect on the third molecule and the fourth molecule and the fifth molecule. So you get these little bitty interactions. Now, if you're a small molecule and you don't have very many electrons, this effect isn't very um, great. But if you have a very large molecule that has all kinds of electrons, So say you have a very large hydrocarbon, and that's the nucleus right there. And this little naughty electron over here says, party at my house. And you get a lot of your electrons over on this side. You can see that the momentary dipole will be greater in the large molecule than it was in the small molecule. So what the effect is, is the same on the second and third and fourth and fifth molecules in terms of them shifting their electrons 
to be opposite of the one before them. But what you get is a stronger attraction because you have a larger partial negative and a larger partial positive there. So that's what tends to happen with the London dispersion forces. Geckos. I need to put the video of this online for you guys because this one will show how geckos use dispersion forces to walk up walls and on windows and whatnot. So their little feet um, don't have a sticky substance on them. Uh, what their little feet have is a, a ton of surface area. So um, yeah, when you see the video, it it zooms way in on um, those little toes and it shows you all these little micro hairs that they have that give it a ton of surface area in which to do the dispersion forces. And they create so many dispersion forces that they can, that their toes are attracted to whatever that they're stepping on so they can walk up walls and windows and whatnot. So relative strengths of these interactions. So ionic attractions are very strong. And then we have hydrogen bonding. And remember, that's a special dipole-dipole uh, interaction. And then we have regular dipole interactions, and then we have dispersion forces. So dispersion forces are very weak, and they get a little bit stronger when you have more electrons there. And dispersion forces are attractions or interactions that every atom or ion or molecule has with every other atom, ion, or molecule. Um, so yes, this is the base of things. All right, so we've got some problems here, and we want to identify the major interactions that we expect for the following molecules to have with other molecules that are exactly the same. So if we were to draw out the Lewis structure for chlorine, what we'd have is this right here. So what we need to take a look at is, is there um, dipole-dipole interactions with another molecule? Are there ionic interactions? If there's dipole-dipole, is it special dipole-dipole, the hydrogen bonding? Or are we just left with dispersion forces? Well, looking at this bond right here, uh, the electronegativity of one chlorine is 3.0, and the electronegativity of the other chlorine is 3.0, so there's no dipole there. So this is a nonpolar covalent bond. as is this one. So there's no polarity there attracting those two chlorine molecules together. Uh, so that means that they don't want to stay close together. So that would indicate to you that they're probably not in the liquid or gas phase. Um, also, they're really small molecules. So this makes sense when we think of chlorine in its natural state, which is a gas. Okay, so then we have C10H22. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I didn't even identify the major interaction. Oh my goodness. So we don't have ions there. We don't have dipole-dipole interactions. And if we don't have dipole-dipole interactions, we can't have special dipole-dipole interactions, uh, which are hydrogen bonds. So we're just left with what? dispersion forces. Or London forces or London dispersion forces. So there's a tiny bit of interaction between a couple of chlorine molecules, but not really. So they bump into each other and they go on their merry way. They're not very attracted to each other. So looking at C10H22, this is something called decane. Ooh, 
Lots of hydrogens here. Okay, just gave myself carpal tunnel drying that big old thing. All right, so do we have ions here? No, we don't have any ions. We see a bunch of covalent bonds. The next question is, do we have any polar bonds? Do we have any bonds where one atom has a large enough electronegativity to be hogging some of the electrons? Well, just in case we forgot, the electronegativity value of carbon is 2.5, and the electronegativity value of hydrogen, let's do a little C there, is 2.1. So the difference is 0.4. And 0.4 still qualifies as nonpolar covalent. So there are no polar bonds in this entire molecule. So is your molecule polar? No. Okay. So we don't have ionic interactions. We don't have dipole-dipole interactions because if we don't have a polar molecule, we don't have a dipole, so we can't have dipole-dipole interactions. And we can't have hydrogen bonding because that's a special dipole-dipole interaction and we don't have any dipoles. So what are we left with here? What we're left with for decane is dispersion forces. So the interaction between one decane and another decane uh, is a bunch of dispersion forces. Now, decane is a, a large molecule. It's not humongous, but it's large. So what happens is there's a lot of electrons that belong to this molecule. So when you have momentary dipoles, you have a larger dipole than you would when you have smaller molecules with fewer electrons and you have a lot more possibilities for momentary dipoles. So decane at room temperature is a liquid. So if you have a molecule and someone tells you you have a molecule that only interacts with other molecules via dispersion forces, well, that would make you tend to think that that was a gas at room temperature because those particles aren't very attracted to each other. But when you have a larger molecule, your dispersion forces start to mean something. And if you have molecules that are more attracted to each other, they tend to sit closer to each other. And if they're closer to each other, that indicates that they're either in the liquid or the solid state. So decane is a liquid. All right, looking at Ki. Now, Ki is potassium iodide, just in case you remember way back to chapter three. And that means that it's an ionic substance. You have a metal and you have a non-metal. And remember when we talked about how to name these and do their formulas, we said look for a metal and a non-metal. So Ki, what we have is we have potassium and we have iodide. And the potassium and iodide will attract other potassiums and iodides. Um, to where you build up a big crystal. So here we have what kind of interactions because we have ions. We have ionic. So ionic bonding or ionic attractions. And things that are ionic tend to be what at room temperature? Solid. And potassium iodide is definitely a solid. Okay, so that brings us to HBr. So if we were to draw HBr, we'd have a covalent bond between hydrogen and bromine. And then we take a look at the electronegativity chart and we would see that hydrogen has a, an electronegativity of 2.1. We've already looked at that one, it's up here. And bromine has an electronegativity of 2.8. So you would do 2.8 minus 2.1, and we would get 0.7. And that definitely qualifies as a polar covalent bond. So it's between 0.4 and 2.0.
it doesn't have as large a polarity like HCl, which had a difference of 0.9, but it's still polar. So what we have is a shift of electrons towards the bromine because that's the more electronegative atom. And if it's interacting with another HBr, and we wanna draw the dipole the other way, we could do it with the delta symbols, and we would see that the negative end of one molecule is interacting with the positive end of the other molecule, and we have what kind of interaction here? Dipole, dipole. Now we don't have any oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine there, so it's not going to be the special kind of dipole-dipole uh, hydrogen bonding. We just have dipole-dipole. So we don't have a we don't have very strong dipoles in these molecules, and the molecule is really small. So HBr at room temperature is still a gas. Okay, so number two says identify the major interaction expected between the following molecules. So now we're going to have two different compounds and we're going to look at the interaction between those two. So water, we've already done in this lecture and we said that because oxygen has a really high electronegativity, that the electrons are pulled towards the oxygen a whole lot. And oxygen was one of those special atoms that could possibly do hydrogen bonding. Now, looking at ammonia, what ammonia is going to look like is this right here. And the question for us is, is there polarity there? Yes, because nitrogen is quite electronegative. And if we go back to the electronegativity chart, we can see this. Nitrogen has an electronegativity of 3.0. Oops, I went way past it. So because the nitrogen's electronegativity is highest, we have a partial negative up there. And then the bottom part of the molecule is partially positive. So we have two molecules that have dipole moments here, that have dipoles. So we definitely are going to have some dipole-dipole interactions. Now the question is, can we have special dipole-dipole interactions, hydrogen bonds between these two molecules? Well, we have a very electronegative atom that has a hydrogen connected to it, and we have a lone pair on another molecule that's on a very electronegative atom. So absolutely, but what we would need to do is we would need to change the orientation of our ammonia, NH3, to see this a little bit more clearly. Okay, so we'll draw our hydrogens this way. And we have, oops, sorry, that hydrogen down there is partially positive. And our nitrogen's partially negative, and all of these hydrogens are partially positive. And we definitely have a hydrogen bonding interaction right there. We could also go ahead and orient our water like this so that the oxygen's pointed towards the hydrogen that is bonded to a very electronegative atom on one molecule and attract it to the lone pair on another molecule that's on a very electronegative atom. So you can get that interaction right there. So what we have here is hydrogen bonding between water and ammonia. 
Now, like I said, everything is also going to have dispersion forces. So when it's dispersion only, that's when we say, okay, just dispersion forces here. When we say dipole-dipole or hydrogen bonding or ionic attractions, what we mean is those plus dispersion forces, okay? So you tend to just say the strongest one and then assume that there's dispersion forces also. All right, formaldehyde and methane. Well, we already talked about methane and we said that it's nonpolar, but let me just draw it again for you. So with methane, we have four nonpolar bonds. So there's no polarity here, so we can't have dipole-dipole or hydrogen bonding, and we have all covalent bonds. We don't have any ions here, so we can't have ionic attractions. So that one right there, it should pretty much tell us that we're only going to have dispersion forces. But what if we drew formaldehyde first? What we would see is this molecule right here that has trigonal planar geometry. And it has a very electronegative atom at the top. So the dipole goes right through the middle here. Or if you wanted to draw it the other way, what we would do is this. We'd put the partial negative up at the top by the very electronegative atom oxygen, and we'd put the partial positives down at the bottom on hydrogens. So here, if we had just drawn formaldehyde first and not drawn methane, we could go, oh, okay, so there's a dipole-dipole possibility there. Um, but then when we draw methane, we see, oh, there's no dipole there and there's no ions. So the only interactions that we're going to have between these two molecules is what? Dispersion. So those two are only going to be attracted by dispersion forces. And again, those are pretty weak. So methane and formaldehyde are probably not going to want to sit really close to each other. All righty. So that brings us to change of state. So going from gas to liquid to solid and then back again. What do we need to do here? What is it called? What do our interactions look like? Um, what's a boiling point? What's the condensation point, melting point, freezing point? All of that stuff we're going to talk about in this section. But I'm going to go ahead and upload the lecture that I just did before I continue on with change of state. And then we'll be done with chapter eight. Yay! Sorry, chapter seven. Yay!